Hi, everyone. I, I should be fast. Um, I have to say, wow, I just came in from Ghana this morning, from Accra, and all of this talk of technology is very impressive. Um, and I want to actually start with a question, which is to say, do you know where your old electronics go to die? And I'm sure some of you know, some of you may think you know, some of you are probably thinking, isn't my old iPhone in that drawer in my desk somewhere? Um, but really the answer to this question lies at the heart of this idea of, of maker cities and the future of productivity in urban spaces. Um, and I want to share five points briefly in these 10 minutes, uh, which have emerged from the work that my uh, design studio, Low Design Office, uh, together with uh, a sort of strategic design consultancy, Pan Urban, have sort of com confronted, let me say, over the last two years, trying to develop a maker community uh, organized around electronic landscapes and a concept we call uh, interclass innovation. So in many cases, and definitely not in every case, but in many cases, far more often than you might expect, uh, this is where your old electronics, except that they're not there. Do I need to do something? I'm assuming it will show up, unless I'm told otherwise. I can see them here. Okay. Um, in many cases, your old electronics, your refrigerators, televisions, computers, laptops, phones, end up in informal sector e-waste dumps in Africa and Asia. Uh, this is Agua Bloshi in the heart of Accra, the capital of Ghana, uh, the largest e-waste dump in Ghana, one of the largest in Africa. Uh, in 2013, it was ranked the most toxic site on earth ahead of Chernobyl in the Ukraine. Um, and essentially, this is where young people live off of your dead electronics, uh, here recovering copper by burning off the plastic sheathings. You can see the soil is black with, with heavy metals, uh, hence the toxicity. And really what you have here is uh, another kind of a nexus, an unfortunate one, which is kind of this toxic marriage between consumerism and planned obsolescence. Um, when we discard these products, they have to be dismantled back into their raw materials. And we can forget about sort of these items from our past, from our history, um, but it shows the imbalance of global, si global society today. Fortunately, there's an alternate reality at the same time. Uh, we work a lot with young hackers, makers in Ghana, uh, where they'll go into this dump looking for scrap copper so they can etch some circuit boards and then come across an old DVD writer and immediately rip, rip it apart to recover the laser so they can make their own laser etcher. Or uh, Afat, who some of you who were at the Fab 10 event uh, probably have heard about, who you know, trained as a geographer but ended up developing the first 3D printer in Africa, sourcing parts out of e-waste. I think it won the award at, uh, or an award at, at, at the Fab 10 event this year. Or Samuel, uh, who, you know, literally just working with some friends, getting a lot of support from the open source community in London, um, but picking up scrap materials, you can even see styrofoam, plastic, uh, off the street, developed a drone, which we're working towards using for doing aerial monitoring of, of, of pollution. Um, and you can see it in the upper right-hand corner, flying for the first time in Agrivloshi. So, out of this kind of dual-sided scenario, uh, the first point is that it's in your nature to be a maker. I think sometimes people talk about it like it's some novel, strange, exotic thing which is just happening, but it really isn't. I mean, from day one, humans have made things. We've made tools to manipulate our environment, to improve our quality of life. Um, and the essence of the maker movement is to say we don't want to just own things, but we equally want to own the capacity to reinvent them, to fix them, to repair them, to hack them. Uh, if hackers are sort of these manipulators of virtual reality, makers extend that into physical reality and ultimately become uh, sort of hackers of, of the real world. Um, you know, what's caused this distortion? Really, it's symptomatic of this era of mass production. And if you look at the use of the word maker over time, it sort of declined as there was sort of this shift towards buying things off an assembly line. 
um, and industrialized production, you see there was an uptick in the 60s and 70s when there was this DIY, back to the earth, do it yourself movement. But people have always made things. And when you had the sort of early hackers that wanted to make bicycles that, could, that they could power and could be a house at the same time or build geodesic domes, there was this community that organized around do it yourself tools and equipment for making. But it was a mail order catalog, right? The, it was constrained by how quickly this information could move around the world and how easily this network of people could actually network their ideas and their energies. Now, today, you have websites like Instructables, there's a million others, where in real time, people can share information about what they've made, how to make it, um, and it, it, in, it drastically accelerates how quickly all of these things can evolve. Um, a second point is that making today is manu digital. And uh, what I love about this word digital is we often think about it nowadays as, as ones and zeros, but we forget the underlying meaning that those digits came from being able to count those numbers and count numbers on our fingers. And to be digital also means to be manual, to use your hands. Um, and making always means to, make your, to use your hands to make things. Before we started talking about factories, we had manufactories. But today what's amazing is that these two means of, of, of digital come back together, where we use our hands to make things, but using digital tools. So if in the past century it was exciting when you had advances in power tools and you could do more things with them, now you have, as has been mentioned earlier in tonight's uh, program, now you have innovations like 3D printers, laser cutters, CNC milling machines, etc. Um, sort of mainstreaming of advances in, in additive manufacturing, but we can actually physically just make things directly in physical space as a, as a printout of something in virtual space. And this extends all the way into some areas that I think are super exciting, like this solar center, I, I think out of Morocco, where literally it, it harnesses the power of the sun, focuses it, and can melt sand uh, to form sort of uh, glass-based ceramics um, uh, as, a, as a printout. Um, there's also another meaning which is to say that you can, everyone basically now has access to free, if not open source, uh, tools for digital modeling so that you can prototype something virtually before you build it in reality. This is a, a solar, a sort of mobile uh, phone charger station we developed with students from Stanford for Nigeria. Um, thirdly, making as a process is community driven. And I think everyone knows this, that you always talk about communities of makers, uh, but it's automatic. The moment you want to make something, you, you turn and look for a community. So when we were making this drone uh, in Agrobloshi, you end up going to the, the computer repair shops where they have digital multimeters or they have spare parts. Uh, we called up our cousins next door at the Woya Lab, the hackerspace in, in Lome, next door in Togo, and said, you know, the really cool stuff you guys are doing, making these uh, Jerry computers where they take functional components of, of, dead, of dead computers and recombine them to make new computers in old uh, sort of oil and petrol uh, jerry cans, which is itself something that they learned through a workshop uh, with a team that came out of Paris and said, you know, why don't you come over to Accra and we'll do a workshop. We can learn how to do this technology transfer, make our own sort of versions of it, and then before you know it, we can do workshops where you can form new communities around making them in Agavloshi and, and harvesting components that can be salvaged out of this e-waste stream. Something else in terms of maker community, everyone's heard of maker fairs, or I think it's maker carnival in, in China. Um, this is Maker Fair Africa, uh, which is cool because essentially people want to just get together and have a maker party and talk about the things that you've made, ask other people for, for the expert you know, knowledge that they have, and, and also just show off the really cool things like this, this young uh, guy, who, this young gentleman who'd made these operable uh, sort of heavy machinery using pneumatics driven by syringes, right? Just wild things, or these young women which got a lot of press for developing a, a generator that runs off of urine. So this idea of, of organizing communities around access to tools and technology is not something which is sort of limited to uh, developing world context or, or let's say West Africa. I mean, it's the same kind of model that you have in the West, for example, in the US with tech shops. Um, quickly, the last two points. The fourth is that maker spaces are emergent. They have to grow up from the grassroots. It cannot be top down. If, if cities or government want to lead, they have to lead first by listening. Uh, in the Agbaloshi example, we've started by mapping this whole ecosystem to see who, do, who does what where. 
and you find that on top of the metal and the copper that people are salvaging, you also have blacksmiths. You have people remelting aluminum that they harvest from old refrigerators and making pots. You have women collecting different types of plastic, cleaning it, sorting it by color, and we can innovate on top of that, like making this、uh, mini kiln, where right now we're able to make、uh, plastic tiles. We're working on being able to reform glass. Uh, and some certain metals like aluminum, and ultimately having a desktop unit like this, where you can dump in your old plastics and output parts that you may want to have access to.、Um, lastly, maker cities are mesh networks, and I think probably most of you understand what mesh networking is, but it's still something strange that we have to get our heads around, which is that we really cannot centralize this movement at all. It's counterproductive. It, it really needs to be. Completely distributed, in the sense that every single node, every single element of the puzzle, needs to be able to actually relay and pass on information, and not have to pass through any gatekeepers whatsoever. And even in the sort of little way in which we're building this makerspace, co-designing it with this community,、uh, a lot of these young people now that have worked on making it in that area, through having worked on it, they actually know how to make it, and they're already trying to go off and replicate it. It's something which takes on a life of its own. Even before we finish the full workshop with its full set of tools,、um, okay, mine stopped. But this is, I guess, another sort of、uh, maybe global example of open source ecology. But trying to actually build 50 tools from which you can build all of civilization, showing that these actually can be produced cheaper than what you're normally buying off the shelf if you have the capabilities. But it's a global network, and each one of these individuals or organizations which are part of this project. Become their own node, which can help on help share and propagate the project. It's not centralized, and if you look at the globe, spaceship Earth, with all of these cities and everyone's talking about development, they tend to overlook that you have to build these local communities around what people want, what they're passionate about, and make sure that you can enable each and every person to make things. And we know that the future will be ruled by robots. The question is, I love this mural from the Fab Lab in Namibia. Are we going to control the robots, or are the robots going to control us? Thank you.